Hello, everybody. My name is Bruce Montgomery, and this is my colleague, Tracy Priest. Hello, everybody. And we're with The Road to Retail. On our podcast, Tracy and I hope to offer tips, insights, ideas, and examples of how small, emerging, or challenger brands can build their business. Largely, we talk about consumer packaged goods, CPG, but we wander here and there from time to time. We'll talk about everything from determining if you're ready to grow, where to start, how to prove it online, how to go about securing distribution at a national retailer, driving your business through to the ultimate end consumer, and how to go about finding an investor if that's important to you. The bottom line is Tracy and I have been doing this a long time. We've made a lot of mistakes. We've done a few good things along the way. But if we can help you smooth out your journey on the road to retail, we'd love to help. Tracy? Absolutely. Thanks, Bruce. Great to have everybody here today. So uh, Bruce and I, like uh, Bruce mentioned, we've been in uh, consumer packaged goods for 30 plus years, all in commercial operations. And what do we mean by commercial operations? We mean sales, marketing, trade marketing, acquisitions, divestitures, product development, uh, managing distributors, managing brokers, managing agencies. Bruce and I, like I said, we've been doing it for a long time have a lot of experience across a, a broad array of commercial operations and consumer packaged goods. So really the purpose of our podcast, as Bruce mentioned, is that we want to share our insights and experiences with our, with our small and emerging brand audience. And then also from time to time, we have on special guests where we uh, interview them and ask th and talk about certain topics that I think that, or we think that would interest our, our audience today. So Bruce, tell us a little bit about who our special guest is today. Oh, thanks, Tracy. So today we have a very special guest. We have <laughs> David Spratt. David is co-founder of the brand Carpe uh, for excessive sweating. David will tell, tell us more detail about this. But David, welcome to the show. And why don't you Happy give us here. a little bit of a background about how you got from uh, from wherever you started to where you are right now? Yeah, it's a pretty quick story because uh, there isn't a lot of background. Uh, basically, I grew up in Atlanta, went to school in North Carolina, so I went to UNC Chapel Hill, met my co-founder, Casper, um, through this cross-campus scholarship program called the Robertson. He was at Duke, and we commiserated over mutually sweaty hands. Um, we graduated in 17 and uh, have been working on Carpe ever since. So that's that's really all the background I have. It's just school and and then Carpe. And obviously, I'd love to share more about, you know, how we got started on the business. Oh, also. Well, we're going to get there. I just want everyone to know that uh, David is not gloating about the recent uh, Carolina victory because <laughs> he knows the tables can turn. But the fact that Casper went to Duke and David at Carolina, Middle East peace is possible. <laughs> and uh, these guys have built a really cool uh, company. So, so you, you mentioned the commiserating around sweaty hands. What else is that backstory, David? Lots of people have an idea. Um, this might be a bit of an overstatement. Yeah. Ideas are kind of easy, but putting it in play like you guys did, that's hard. So tell us a little more about how you guys went from shooting the breeze to getting Carpe to be a real business. Yeah, so we had this problem and we decided to do something about it. It's as simple as that. So we spent a little over a year and well over 60 prototypes just making different formulations, combinations of this ingredient, that ingredient, uh, to really make this product, this formula, this antiperspirant lotion that worked for our sweaty palms. And we were doing fun experiments like, you know, we'd take latex gloves and apply the product to one palm and not apply it to the other, put latex gloves on both, watch a scary video to induce the sweating, and then weigh the gloves after to see the differential. And so, you know, we were doing all of these experiments, uh, using products every day, having friends test the product. And after a year, we finally made something that just really worked for us. And from there, we decided really as a side project to launch it online. Uh, we were planning on doing other things with our lives. I was doing pre-med. I did pre-med. I was interested in going to medical school. I would have been a terrible doctor. So thank God that didn't happen. Casper was studying physics and computer science. And he was planning on getting a PhD in comp sci, post-grad. Um, really, two things changed everything for us. 
the first was just this overwhelming response that we got from customers. Uh, the, we were customer service at the time. So any like customer calls, whatever it would go straight to my cell phone or Casper's cell phone, whoever was on uh, at that on that day. And the first customer service call we ever got turned out to be a voicemail, fortunately for us, because this grandmother named Lisa was crying. Like she was just bawling, crying, talking about how much this product, this antiperspirant lotion for sweaty hands had, in her words, completely changed the trajectory of her granddaughter's life. And for us, that was eye-opening and mind-boggling because, you know, for for Catherine and I, it was annoying, it was frustrating, you know, it got in the way of confidence, but it, it we didn't fully understand the depth of the emotional resonance um, that this problem and solution could really have. So that obviously was very fulfilling for us. And then the second thing was that we were hearing similar feedback from dermatologists about patients that they'd recommend that this product to. And from both customers and dermatologists, we were getting feedback, hey, can you make something for my sweaty feet? Can you make something for my face and my boob sweat, my groin sweat, and my underarm sweat because I've tried everything out there and nothing's worked for me. And that's really when we saw the opportunity to build a brand focused on sweat care for everywhere. And so that's what we've done, um, trying to build Carpe into a household uh, household name and really want Carpe to be as synonymous with sweat as Kleenex is to tissues. So that's the goal. And uh, that's that's the vision that we're marching towards. Oh, I well, love that. Man, that's super interesting. <clears throat> Tracy? Yeah, so we uh, talk a lot about um, on our show, David, about how important differentiation and having a new unique product. So tell us a little bit about how you uh, tested the product with consumers before before launching it. Yeah, re really every every product that we ever launch goes through pretty extensive customer panel testing. Uh, both, you know, there's formal and then there's informal. On the formal side, you have independent labs that can do all of their efficacy studies, stuff like that. But then on the informal side, you just have customers that have reached out with a pain point or a problem. And you just build that list over time. And these pr people uh, are really engaged, right? They want something that works. And because we are making products that solve real problems, we're not trying to make a better moisturizer, or better this or better that. We're trying to make new products that solve pain points that are largely unresolved. And so uh, we build these lists of customers who have problems that um, haven't been addressed. And then when we have a product that we think addresses that problem, we'll reach out, build, you know, build out a testing panel, just test different prototypes after prototype after prototype until you know, the overwhelming response that we're getting from these panels is when and how can I buy this product? I don't care how much it costs. I just want it and I want it now. Um, and so that's, it's an iterative process, but it's extremely customer oriented because that's, you know, how you make good products that other people will want to. So what's so interesting I there, David, is as you mentioned, um, you know, the panels and reaching out to consumers, we, we have lots of smaller brands that just kind of wing it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So that that approach and also your story about that grandmother kind of really resonates as a as a former brand manager. I guess you're always a brand manager if you've ever been one. <laughs> the fact that you're covering both <laughs> benefits, the physical benefit of minimizing the the sweat or the sweaty hands in the in, instance uh, that, that you reported, but also the emotional benefit of improving yeah. confidence. I mean, boy, yeah. Well, often the emotional benefit is more powerful, but the physical benefit has to deliver or you have no shot at the emotional yeah. benefit. Man, that's great. Tracy? I just wanted to reiterate one thing that I, that uh, David said that I love is that you're really creating consumer demand. You're identifying a problem, then you're testing it, and then the consumer's coming back and saying, yes, that works. And you're really completing the loop of identifying a problem, I have a solution, and I think that's a yeah. brilliant way to develop a product. So I just wanted to I mean, it's, emphasize. Yeah, it's, it's how we make ads. It's how we do our marketing. Like we read reviews, and reviews can be really descriptive and extremely informative. And we have customer calls. You know, everyone on the marketing team is constantly having conversations over the phone with customers. Um, Half-hour-long calls where you can just dive it really dive in, dig in. 
um, understand their stories, their use cases, before and afters, you know, how they're feeling. And then you can build really great creative that speaks to other people because you can, you know, really viscerally and clearly explain what these products are doing and how they're doing and how, uh, what the outcome is. And so, you know, one of our best ads of all time just came from a, we just turned a customer inside a customer review into an ad. Uh, this review on Amazon was like, oh, I use this product uh, when I'm mowing the lawn so sweat doesn't get in my eyes and burn in the summer. And so we just made an ad out of that and it's absolutely crushed. Um, so I think customers have so much, so much value uh, to give outside of the dollars that they bring, right? In terms of their preferences, their insights, um, their feelings, uh, their opinions about product, new product existing, uh, you know, emotions, what's resonating, what's not. So we spend a lot of time with our customers and it's paid off. Well, so what's interesting about that is a lot of bigger companies that have the customer service phone numbers or emails, uh, having worked at a couple of those, they frankly pray that no one ever contacts them because they view the whole thing as a cost. And they, you know, there's literally clocks on some customer service reps in, in the real big ones. It's in the room oh, wow. and it shows how long you've been on the phone and being on the phone too long is bad. But look at the way you guys are mining that data. I mean, you you just said uh, it could be a half hour. Great. Yeah, and, I love and that. You've got all that learning for free. Tracy, manufacturing yeah. challenges. I'm sure David's never had any. <laughs> oh, Never. Sure. So, David, one of the challenges that we hear a lot from small emerging brands is trying to find one, trying to find a contract manufacturer, two, trying to find one that will work with a small small emerging brand, and three, some a lot of times the MOQ uh, is just astronomical. So tell us a little bit about your experience with uh, working with contract manufacturers. How did you find one? And yeah. maybe some insights on what to really look for. And before you go, David, MOQ, folks, for those that don't know, is minimum order quantities. So again, when you're trying to get started, you don't want someone who's going to tell you the minimum order is 50,000 cases. That like sinks the ship on day one. Go yeah. ahead, David. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Boris. For no, it, that. Yeah. So I think overall, we've been really fortunate uh, with our manufacturing partners. I do think we've gotten quite lucky um, in a lot of ways. The original manufacturer that we first started working with, really low MOQs. I, th I think one key is that um, we were never, in the in the conversations we were having with manufacturers, and even, even today, we're never focused on like what we're doing right now, what we're doing today. Uh, we're always focused on where we see the brand going and what we see the potential as, because we really believe it. And we see the opportunity is, uh, is, is absolutely massive. And so I think we found people, um, manufacturers, uh, high quality ones that were willing to, um, you know, bring on business at lower MOQs to really help us get off the ground because they saw the vision, right? They saw the opportunity and they saw the long-term potential of what building a relationship uh, could also do for them. And so um, that that was really big for us. Uh, today, you know, obviously you have issues with manufacturers um, all the time, whether it's uh, just them being on time and hitting their dates mm -hmm. or uh, being responsive. And I think the key is, is always having, and you know, you may have a manufacturer of this product, but always having like a backup validating other manufacturers for your products has been really productive. So we can pretty seamlessly transition doing tech, call it tech transfers. Um, you know, pretty seamlessly transfer products and formulas to manufacturers that are over delivering, um, that are, you know, beating timelines that are uh, really just being incredibly responsive and uh, doing great on new product development and um, being just very customer oriented, right? There's some manufacturers that they just don't care about you and that's never going to change. And you have to know that. So I think finding manufacturers where you can be uh, a customer and a client eventually um, that they really, really care about uh, because you, you know, at some point can be a significant portion of their sales. Um, I think that's been key. So targeting smaller to medium sized manufacturers um, has, has been helpful, obviously that have, you know, their quality standards have to be top notch. They have to do everything perfectly well. Um, and so auditing them, having, um, you know, regulatory consultants do audits as well and making sure 
all of your partners are are doing what they should be doing um, and doing it to to the best um, and the highest quality that they can. So uh, yeah, I think overall we've had a good experience, no nightmare situations. Um, anyone that we've left, we've left just because we could get a better price or better quality or combination of both better service um, elsewhere. And so we've moved products around um, and we have a really good set uh, all over all over the US. That's so awesome. folks, one of the things I'd like to just reiterate, and Tracy's pointed this out in previous episodes, when you deal with contract manufacturers, David said, having a backup supplier qualified and ready to go is key. Because if you're a small brand just getting started, yeah. whether you're direct to consumer only, or you're starting to pick up some brick and mortar retailers, no one wants to hear your story about why you can't ship. Nobody. Exactly. You know, one of our one of our bumper stickers is the only thing a retailer or a customer uh, hates more than a product that doesn't sell is one that doesn't ship. Tracy, <laughs> did did you have anything else here on manufacturing? No, I think, nope, I think that's perfect. Thank you, thank you, David. Great. So, so David, you you touched on this a little bit um, earlier, but is there any other uh, insight or color you'd like to add around how you guys? identify, filter, and pursue new items to add to your line? Yeah. So um, also in terms of manufacturers, just really quickly, and 3PLs, one one thing that uh, I think can be lost today is, uh, especially during COVID, post-COVID, everything's become very virtual in a lot of ways. And so you'll hire people virtually, you're, you'll hire buyer manufacturers virtually, the power of an on-site in-person visit to a CM or to a 3PL uh, cannot go understated. I think that's mm -hmm. something that we have done um, well. You know, Casper will just get on a flight. We're having an issue at a manufacturer. He'll book a flight for the next morning, be there. Problem will get solved in a matter of hours. Whereas if we try to do stuff like asynchronously over email, over phone, phone may take two weeks. And so we've just seen so much power um, and, and opportunity and just going on site and being there and um, obviously evaluating in person and then also fixing problems in person. Um, that's been that's been really key. And so uh, in terms of, Bruce, uh, you were asking about uh, new products in terms of like new product identification. Yeah, I mean, Correct. really, we, we know what the brand's about, like all things sweat. And sweat care for everywhere. And so um, new product launches have really centered around what the biggest need states are. And that's come from customers. Like what has what are the highest volume like inbound customer inquiries? Like what are people asking about? What are people wanting? Where are the opportunities? And just constantly through those conversations and through you know post-purchase survey data that we collect. Um, and surveys that we'll send out and just customer service emails that will come unsolicited inbound. Um, we'll just track everything and really understand like, okay, what are customers wanting? Both existing customers and new potential customers um, that we haven't acquired yet or that aren't part of the brand. And so, yeah, I think it's really just all things customer. What are people saying? What are people wanting? Um, that's relevant to sweat. Obviously customers will be like, I want a soap. And I'm like, we're not gonna make a soap. Um, but that's just, you know, that that's not what we're focused on. We're focused on making sweat products. So I think having a, a clear, defined, like, this is the, the box. This is where we play. We play in sweat products um, is, you know, makes it a lot easier to say no to the endless number of new product opportunities and ideas that do come up. Yeah, so that's that's a great point because uh, almost in anything in business, it's almost as important to know what you're not going to do as well as what you are. Because if it doesn't pass yeah, that first sure. filter, you you can save your time. And so many brands have tried crazy extensions, and you know they're 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 throwing stuff against the wall for the hoping that they get some who knows pipeline volume and maybe one skew lives. That may be a luxury if you're a gigantic brand, but when every day is existential, you just can't do that. So I salute your discipline. Excellent. Tracy? Yeah, so um, Carpe is a, uh, David is a, obviously a direct to consumer brand. Tell us a little bit about how you made that decision that this is what we were gonna do. This is where we were gonna 
really focus our efforts. Yeah. So tell us a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, journey. It's, it's similar to kind of following our customers and and what they're needed. We've followed our our own like areas of expertise and what we know and what we don't know, and I think we've leaned into what's really working and not gotten. You know, everyone gets distracted by shiny objects, but we've been very intentional about staying focused on uh, what we know and what's working and what, you know, we strongly believe will uh, continue to work um, and drive future growth. And so I think from a channel strategy standpoint, we always started Amazon and our website. Uh, a lot of people over the past five years, like ignored Amazon and were pure D to C. Uh, that never made sense to me because, and, and we actually launched on Amazon before we you know, had a website, just because there's existing search traffic. People are going to Amazon and searching like how to stop sweaty hands, how to stop sweaty feet. Um, you know, why is my face sweating? And so there's just a tremendous amount of organic volume that you can capture by having a, a strong listing and, and your products available um, ranking for those searches. And so um, it's really been an Amazon and website focus for us. We uh, have kind of explored brick and mortar uh, in the past, and it's just, it's not our area of expertise. It's not our focus. And so by really leaning in to what we know well and what we've developed, you know, an expertise around, which is all things e-com, if you will, um, that's really helped us uh, grow quickly and profitably and um, and you know, see, see a lot of success. I, I hate using the word success because, you know, until Carpe is a household name brand and it's used by, you know, tens of millions of people, uh, you know, 10 and 20 years down the road, um, then maybe it'll be successful. But uh, yeah, we, we got a long way to go, but things are, are definitely on the right track. Well, you got to you got to keep that edge when you start resting, thinking you're successful. That's when there's a lot of things getting bigger in the rearview mirror. Right. Happy, never satisfied. That's what one of our high school football coaches used to always say. Ooh, that's right. Well, gosh, our high school basketball coach, we couldn't say what he used to say. We'd be uh, censored. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, it. so so moving moving along, you know, for those of you that for people out there that might be familiar with your brand, I mean, I've seen you guys on Sports Center. I've seen you guys, yeah. you know, pop up online. Um, so maybe you have profiled me as having sweaty hands. I'll have to check, <laughs> but, uh, can you talk a little bit, David, about the, the tactics that you guys have, you can run the whole gamut. This is all the stuff we've tried. And then we've come and done this and you've been very, again, yeah. deliberate and we stick to our knitting. We know what works. We'll still do some testing, but then we kind of come home for the bigger bets. So we, tell we the test it's, it's, yeah, it's similar to product. Actually, we test a lot. Um, but we test within the the sandbox that you know we are confident in. So it's you know for product, it's sweat products. We're gonna we're gonna test new sweat products, um, and we're not gonna venture out because that's not what we're about. Um, on you know ecom like D 2 C Amazon, we're testing a lot uh, all the time. New channels, um, new you know merchandising strategies, uh, new listings like new bundles, new, um, you know, subscription portals, whatever it is. Like we're constantly AB testing everywhere. New creative. We tested, you know, thousands of ads last year. Um, and some of those only get a couple hundred dollars to spend before we next it. We learn from it and then, you know, we, we try something else. And so we're, we're testing a lot. Um, the, there's no upside to testing if you're not going to spend the time to learn from the winners and the mm. losers. And so building a system around the testing. So we're not just like constantly doing a bunch of random stuff and um, going into what works and never reflecting on the why of what's working and what's not um, that, that would be utterly useless. So I think across creative uh, across channels, across you know media buying strategies, um, our website, Amazon, we're constantly A/B testing, uh, ABCDEF testing, um, different angles, different personas, uh, different problem solution statements, uh, different selling points of of products, and then you know we're being um, pretty diligent about recording the learnings uh, from those tests. 
So David, if you guys use um, influencers or spokespeople, I mean, that's really popular right now. And we've all seen stories of outrageous success and huge catastrophes because the influencer <laughs> turns out to be kind of a kook. Do, do you guys use that as a tool? And if so, how do you kind of, you know, vet them so that you know what you're getting into? Yeah, so we haven't really used influencer that much. Um, we've really leaned into, I mean, we built the business on linear TV, actually. Um, and remnant linear, uh, when most everyone is focused on meta, Facebook, Instagram. And obviously now, you know, we do linear, we do a ton of Facebook, Instagram, we do a ton of TikTok. Uh, paid, uh, obviously Amazon ads, Google, um, and testing other channels as well. Um, we really haven't unlocked YouTube yet, but I see a, a big opportunity in YouTube for us since we're very like video forward. We make a ton of video content. Um, so yeah, we've tested a lot, lean into what's worked and uh, sorry, Bruce, what were you asking about? I, I just got off on a little just, bit of a tangent. Just really asking, David, you know, which of the tactics that are out there, you're, to be honest, you're covering it with your answer right now. You know, what have you guys seen that works? Because again, for, for small emerging challenger brands, even big brands yeah. are supposed to behave like every dollar is precious, but we all know sometimes yeah. they don't. So just kind of getting your story of, you know, again, you've been very deliberate test and learn. Yeah. We're kind of all over the place, but we're also measuring what we did and trying to learn from it versus, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're just starting out and if you're just launching a brand, I would, obviously you want like your Google ads to be up. I wouldn't be running like a ton of non-branded, like small amounts of non-branded, but really you, you want, you know, your low cost, like high efficiency, high efficiency, non-branded, you're branded. Um, so you can capture any like traffic that you're driving. And then really I, I would focus on Instagram and Facebook tests like that. That's the, it still is like a lot of people post iOS 14 uh, shit on meta for not being nearly as effective. Like it's still the greatest advertising engine ever built. Um, and so that is still where I would start. It is the most cost effective way to test it, uh, different, uh, angles, you know, whether people are interested in your product, you can see the engagement, the click through, right. You can really understand whether, uh, your product has potential and your brand has potential through, you know, some like Facebook and Instagram tests alone. Um, so I would really focus there just because, um, it's it's the best way for us. We captured a ton of organic uh, traffic on Amazon. We tested some Facebook. We couldn't get it to work. Um, we, you know, tested leaning in heavily to you know Google non branded. Really couldn't get that to work. Couldn't get YouTube to work. And then linear, we were looking at proactive, and we we're like, hmm, we're really trying to do something in sweat, similar to what proactive did in the acne space in the eighties what really worked for them, you know, linear TV, obviously celebrity partnerships and, and whatnot. And so people think about TV and they think massive budgets to test. We tested with $5,000 a week, 15 grand wow. over three weeks. And we were able to really understand um, the impact of those dollars uh, and what the potential of the channel was. And so um, I think any, any like ad platform will try to sell you on, you need to spend, this much money to really understand whether and, and mostly it's smoke, right? Oh, yeah. Like you, you can get a read pretty quickly, whether something's working or not. And then from a cost side to keep costs low on the test, like we made all of our ads in house. So we, you know, had our, had a camera that we rented from Duke, um, set it up in a warehouse. Casper and I were just like yelling at a screen or yelling at a camera, very like direct response oriented, problem solution oriented. Um, it didn't, it, wasn't pretty, didn't have to be, um, to understand whether the channel had life, right? That's, that's what we were trying to figure out in the lowest possible way. Like, does this have life and can we, if we improve creative, spend more time in it, um, can we really scale this? And so, uh, that's, that's been our approach historically. I mean, we, we test like, you know, in package stuff does including, and we'll do, um, you know, like AB tests in package. So we won't, it won't be period over period. It'll be this order got this this next order got that. Um, we tested like transparency on sticks 
you know, a white stick versus a transparent stick. So if you see uh, when the product's going to run, is that going to improve repurchase, test different mailers, different boxes, different inserts, um, and you just track repurchase over time and understand what's working and what's not. So I think um, in every way, it's it's really like what's going to have the highest impact. So from a testing methodology, it's ease, confidence, and impact. Um, so like how easy is it going to be to test? Um, and that's also like cost, right? How much is it going to cost? How confident are you in the test? And then what's the potential impact? If this does work and we test it and it works on a small scale, like what's the, the bigger impact of if we really roll this out? Uh, how, how big of a size of prize is it, if you will? So Yeah, how high is up? Yeah, I've sat in way too many agency meetings where uh, somewhere the sentence gets uttered of, we need to spend at least $5 million. Sometimes right, I yeah. stop listening after that. But speaking <laughs> of money, Tracy... Yes, absolutely. One thing I wanted to just uh, emphasize here for our audience today is, you know, what David said is we're not testing just to test, right? We're testing to learn and you're taking those learnings yeah. and applying those. And I think that's yeah. just such a critical po uh, point to po point out to our audience. Don't test just to test. Don't test yeah. just to learn, but test to learn to have an impact yeah. on the business. And I think that's just... Yeah. That's a super nugget for today. Yeah, and one so, more yeah. thing, right? I, yeah. One more thing there, Trace, real fast. So what Tracy's saying and what David just articulated is really interesting because some people will say, oh yeah, we test and learn. And it's like, I spent this much money. I got this sales, that didn't work, it's gone. But all the examples David gave, did you change the way, was the product in that picture and not in this one? Was it a clear stick? Was it, was it white? You know, when did we run this? I mean, there are so many little pieces and um, it, it can be challenging to measure, but you have to know what you changed or you don't really know what worked. Sorry, Tracy. No, that's good. I appreciate that. So uh, last, last uh, topic we're going to talk about today, which comes up with uh, every founder, small emerging challenger brand that we talk to, money. So tell us a little bit about <laughs> your thoughts on raising money and, yeah. and how that can help accelerate growth. So just tell us a little bit about, you know, what your what your thought is on invest inv and investors. So what kind of investor would you look for if you were looking looking for money? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think um over the past couple of years, like early venture dollars have really dried up in the CPG space. Yeah. Uh, growth dollars are still there, right? You have a proven brand, you're doing eight figures in sales and you need some growth capital to, you know, do some sort of expansion. Maybe you're all online, you're doing 20 million in sales, you want to launch in retail. Like there are investors for that, right? To scale something that's already working. Obviously private equities, um, there's a lot of private equity and consumer, uh, but for more, you know, mature, if you will, businesses. But for the earliest stages, I think venture is fully dried up. And the reason for that is they just like most CPG brands aren't going to provide venture returns in the time frame that they really are are required. And most great brands are built over decades. I mean, like, you know, Stanley that's blowing up now is a hundred year old company, hundred year old brand. And I think if you look at the big ones, PNG, Unilever, and all of those brands, they're, you know, most of them are 50 plus years old. And so I think overall consumer brands are meant to be built over time. Um, and I think they're also, you know, what, what we're seeing now and what I'm seeing across a lot of, you know, founders, a ton of founders and a ton of new brand, emerging brands that are just launching, everyone's bootstrapping, like bootstrapping is back. Uh, that's what, that's what everyone's saying. And so um, getting something off the ground uh or just doing friends and family that allow for inventory dollars um, and, you know, give you 100, 200,000 bucks to uh, get inventory, test initial ads, really get a proof of concept and start, um, start growing something. But I think uh, from a raising standpoint, it, it's really, you never want to raise just to raise, right? I think for a little bit, raising money was cool. And everyone is bragging about how much money that they raised as opposed to how much money they were making. And which is, is funny. Uh, it's like everyone's praising people that raise a ton of money. It's like, hey, look at look at how diluted we are. Look at how much money we raised. 
Um, and, and it just doesn't make sense because you only raise money if the business really needs to raise money in order to succeed. I think most consumer brands can succeed long term without the need to raise uh, capital. Um, if a brand does need to raise capital because of like life situation, like Casper and I couldn't have bootstrapped something. We just didn't have the funds, right? Uh, we were at college. And so um, we got some money from three local Duke grads, the bootstrap advisors, 50 grand, and we're able to, you know, get the business uh, to a, a million bucks in, in sales based on that. Um, and then from there, you know, we raised money from like angel groups, high net worth individuals uh, and uh, some funds, but but really not it's mostly just like high net worths and angels that have longer time horizons. Um, and we're excited about the opportunity. And I we've had a phenomenal experience with our investors, with our board members, everything. I, I feel very, very lucky and extremely blessed um, for the people that we have in our in our ecosystem. We have learned so much from them um, and we lean on them for advice and guidance. I think uh, Casper and I have spent a lot of time trying to find great people, great mentors, people that you know we can get great advice from. Um, and that's paid off uh, personally, professionally, like for the business and just for ourselves, for our own growth. Um, that's been an incredible, incredible part of this journey. So, yeah, I think overall summary is you don't need to raise if, if you don't need to raise money, then don't. Um, and I think consumer brands, especially, there are ways to very scrappily test uh, and learn and get something off the ground and then raise money um, from, you know, uh, later stage investors if you have something that that's growing. And I see I, you know, have a bunch of founders that I am in you know group chats with now, most of whom they've all bootstrapped their their brands, and some of them are doing in the hundreds of millions of sales. And so um, it is very very possible to bootstrap, um, and it's just, you just have to be really creative. I think one of the beautiful things um, is that creates uh, you know constraints breed creativity, uh, if you will. Um, and so yeah, but it. All that to say, if you are raising, um, then I, you know, I think, especially in the consumer space, there are a ton of angels and high net worths that want to get involved and that want to participate and can bring value, right? Like for us, we found the former CEO of Proactive. He was the president of Gutty Rinker. And that was like a very specific person that we wanted. Um, founder of SkinCeuticals, like people that were in our space, in our ecosystem that could really help. Um, and that, you know, they also wanted to help build something. And so it, it worked both ways. And those kinds of investor partnerships are amazing. And those are the ones that I think you really want to look for if you are raising. But I, yeah, I think for the most part, like very simply, if you are raising money, like find great people um, and people that can bring value. Uh, but sometimes you just need money uh, and you have to be somewhat like Machiavellian about it. It's like, I, I need money. I need to get money. And, um, and then you just kind of find your way uh, towards it, whoever it's coming from. I think that can have obviously long-term uh, potential consequences um, if they're not the right people. But um, mm -hmm. overall, I think, I think some people are, are more afraid of raising than they probably should be um, because it's, there are a ton of great people out there and uh, there are a ton of people that are able to write, you know, $25,000 checks. Um, and so, uh, that's that's what my focus would be if I was an early stage founder, if I needed to to raise, but I would try everything in my power to bootstrap something. Yes, so Sorry. that's that's really good. And folks, one of the things David said in there along the way is about dilution. So you got to remember as as you take money from people, you're giving them a piece of your action. and as David said, also, if you're raising money when you don't really need it, suddenly you own less and less of what you're trying to get off the ground. And as you take money from people, unless it's possibly your parents, um, that comes with responsibility to report back. And sometimes that reporting is quite formal and it can be time consuming. And these people that have sent you money, they might want to call up David and ask him questions. And he may or may not really want to talk to them at this point in time, but you're, you're somewhat obligated. So David, that was really fantastic color. So we don't want to, we want to be cognizant of your time here. So 
if uh, if people wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to, you know, maybe send you a note about something they heard or ask you about Carpe or, or you know, send you a big check because they liked what they heard and they want to buy your company? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, final thing on investors. Again, I, I do feel like we've gotten very lucky and we wouldn't have wanted it any other way, right? We were in a place where we wanted, uh, we were willing to sacrifice equity and, you know, get diluted to bring people that have been there and done it into the business and to get that guidance and advice, obviously capital uh, that we really, you know, we're looking for. And so don't regret that at all. Um, I do it the, the same if we were to do it again and I've had a great experience raising. So um, even though I, I was definitely advocating for only raising if you absolutely had to, um, it's definitely a case by case basis. And, and we've had a phenomenal experience with it in terms of reaching out. Um, love to chat. My cell is 404-661-6718. You can just text me. Um, my email is david at mycarpe.com. Um, and, you know, yeah, I'm I'm always happy to chat. Pay it forward. People, we have gotten to where we are now because of people that were willing to help give advice. And so um, we're always willing to, to hop on the phone uh, or, um, or Zoom or whatever it is and answer any questions people have. Thank you awesome. so much. Thanks so much. Tracy, the big finish. Absolutely, David. Thank you so much. So insightful today. Can't wait uh, for our audience to hear this uh, this episode, which will be coming up uh, soon. But uh, please continue awesome. to follow us on our uh, where you can find any of your podcasts. So iTunes, we're available, Spotify, as well as on our LinkedIn page and our YouTube page. So We'd really appreciate the uh, the follow on any of those. And uh, thank you again, David. And uh, good luck out there. Good luck out Thanks, there, Thanks, Tracy. Folks. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks for having me. Yep.